Start recording. There we go. Yeah. Good evening. Well, this it's the evening. So, hello, everyone. Um, today, what are we going to talk about? There's a first announcement I wanted to make, although I don't think there's any woman on the channel, but I want you to relay the information if you can. So, I don't know if you've seen the news, but uh, Sydney and Amber from the PowerShell team, they are um, they are uh, creating an event um, on June the 4th, I believe, from 9 to 11 a.m. Uh, PDT, uh, sorry, PST, so Pacific time. And and please, I will share the links and, and some more information in a bit. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, really to encourage women in IT and to discuss and then have a chat and maybe do some presentation and stuff. Um, after that, uh, we've got Bartek with us today. He's going to talk about his experience with DSC class resource uh, and what he did and the problems he found and things like this. Uh, next time, maybe I will do a presentation on uh, integration tests for DSC resource with Test Kitchen. And then we're going to cover uh, today after Bartek's talk, we're going to cover uh, some community questions and some news. So. Um, like there's a specific one about SQL Server DSC that Johan is going to talk about, and then I'm going to give you a quick update of what's been released and um, what's been converted to the new CI. So this is the Women in PowerShell DevOps. Um, please forward the information to all the women doing PowerShell DevOps things uh, that you know of, and uh, retweet. We've sent a few tweets already, and uh, we're going to send another one in two minutes. Uh, that you can retweet. And it's uh, organized by, uh, I don't know if you know, Sydney, Sydney Smith and Amber from the uh, PowerShell team. Uh, so if you have any questions, you see the Sydney's email um, at the bottom of this page here. There we go. And that's the link you can share. And I've already shared the uh, slides on the DSC channel on Slack. Oh, Katie is there. Hello, Katie. Hello. Long time, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's so different. <laughs> yeah, slightly different. All right. So, um, uh, Bartek, I let you share your screen, and then you can go ahead. So then you have uh, you have enough time for your presentation, and then after that, we're going to cover some of the stuff that we've been releasing stuff. Okay. Let's give it a try. Can you guys see my screen now? Fine for me. Yep. Excellent. Um, presentation with the PowerPoint is the presentation that didn't happen. So let me just start with opening my PowerPoint and uh, yeah, maybe do it with minus fours so we get the time updated. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, PowerShell uh, DSC class-based resources. And this talk was initially planned for uh, PS Confu, and the agenda was more or less something like that. But then I realized that the audience here is slightly different. So the audience for uh, PS Confu is generally that you don't have just DSC experts in the room. And by that, you need to explain certain things that might not be necessary for you guys and the calls. Uh, so instead of doing that, I decided, okay, let's just skip certain parts. So let's just uh, change this event to event to um, DSC community call. And if I get all this info, I expect that there are only DSC experts in the room. And if I uh, get the agenda right now, it's going to be slightly different. So some things, as you can see, explaining why do you would create DSC resources, that part I will skip. I will just briefly mention one of the points here because uh, Hale got really uh, anxious about that one and uh, you probably can guess which one it is. Anyways, um, so first before we jump into uh, the whys and uh, and uh, all the, 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 the goodies that I had prepared, I wanted to explain why do I think that I'm a good person to explain that subject to you. And uh, I'm working for Optiver. This is a company based in Amsterdam together with Daniel, who is also here on the call. And what we are doing is uh, 
basically we try to do anything we can with DSC. And uh, we very quickly discovered that uh, the PowerShell 4 and DSC that was offered with it was it's just awful. And we didn't like it at all. Um, so the moment the PowerShell 5 was shipped, we moved to that one. And uh, while doing that, we also decided, OK, if you're going to go to PowerShell 5, maybe let's just take a look at those class based resources because that's where Microsoft it felt at the time that was hitting. So uh, and once we started altering those resources, we realized that we never want to go back. Um, so thus far, we created 25 class based resources, uh, 25 modules with class based resources. We have around 75 different resources without, within this, those modules. And I checked our Git history just to be sure that I'm not uh, not making stuff up. So the first commit that I uh, that was created that contained class based resource happened in uh, December 2015, I think. 2015, December 2015. So we have uh, five years experience with this technology. Uh, so we managed to uh, fail a, lo a lot of times. We, we uh, found a lot of pitfalls that you could uh, fall into and we got out of them. So we feel like we can, uh, we can with confidence say that we know what we are doing. Um, so uh, that's basically what I wanted to say. Um, one thing to, to notice here, uh, you're probably asking yourself question, okay, you guys have this uh, so many resources, where are they? I didn't see them ever. Uh, I, did, I cannot find them on GitHub, what's going on? Um, the problem is that we haven't really decided on any kind of uh, internal uh, policy for publishing this code. Obviously, it was written within our organization, therefore it's owned by an organization. We are tr working hard to get some kind of uh, policy on that one set up so that we can actually publish some of things. And obviously not all of them will uh, be uh, suitable for you guys because some of them really make sense only in our environment. For example, I have a resource to uh, configure Bamboo. Uh, not sure if you even heard about it. If you heard about it, you probably know how awful it is. If you didn't hear about it, don't worry. It's not you, you should sleep tight. You're not not missing any anything. But this is this is the build agent that we actually use in our organization, and therefore we needed to be able to describe it somehow. Um, so I, for PS Confu, as I mentioned, I was planning to explain why would you create an, uh, any resource in, in your organization, and. Um, the only thing I want to mention here is that, that uh, I have a point here: public not good enough. Uh, it's mainly applies to the building uh, resources that, that, for example, we couldn't really work with uh, environment for a path variable. We didn't like the way it's programmed and the way it uh, changes the path, uh, and we also didn't like the fact that you couldn't reuse it uh, in multiple partials. We, we use partials extensively. You should know about that. Um, um, and uh, those things basically were not really working for us. And also we very often found some major or minor bugs in the public DC resources uh, that you guys maintain maybe. And um, the problem was that sometimes we got uh, immediate feedback, we could fix it, and then we tried to do that. Daniel was, was definitely doing that a lot. Uh, maybe I'm not so much. Uh, but sometimes you really had to wait for way too long. Then, then we sometimes we decided, okay, let's just just kind of fork it and then then change a little bit. But very often we will just find ourselves in a situation where we change so much that it didn't make any sense to maintain the compatibility with the one that is in the public resources. Especially the, considering the fact that the public resources are generally uh, the uh, script, uh, sorry, MOF uh, based resources, and we don't really consider ourselves uh, comfortable doing that anymore. We didn't, we stopped doing that uh, a few years back. Um, so there are a few reasons why we chose uh, to do class-based resources. And um, first of all, what we like about it is that you are very explicit when you build these resources using classes. Uh, in moth based world, you basically just create a folder it should be named DC resources, but from my experience, it doesn't even have to be named like this. And within this folder, you create some subfolders with some fake mo like modules uh, structures and magic happens and then you get the resource. With class-based resource, you cannot really do that this way. You have to be explicit about it. You have my own manifest where you specify uh, which DC resources you're planning to export and then 
all this thing is actually very explicit and given in the, the, the manifest of your uh, DC resource module. The second thing we did like a lot is that we didn't need to use any kind of tooling for MOF. Uh, we didn't have to write it by hand, which I don't think anybody sane is doing. But uh, even changing MOFs by hand sometimes happens and it feels like uh, not really the most pleasant experience you might have, especially if you are more familiar with this uh, PowerShell syntax. Um, and uh, the problem with this one was that uh, you kind of had always this disconnect between the meta and actual code that would perform the action. So meta code was, was in this MOF uh, schema document and the actual code that would perform the action was uh, in your PSM1 file. They had to be aligned, that, that had to be maintained by you or maybe use, using some tooling you would maintain it. And you would have to always test it yourself. Uh, with uh, the class-based resources, this disconnect doesn't happen. Therefore, you don't have to worry about uh, um, syncing the both entities at a certain point in time. And uh, last but certainly not least, especially for people like me that tend to type, mistype, and make a typos in almost every pull request they create, uh, val it validates your inputs and your code while you are, you are authoring it, which means that you don't have to run any test command in order to verify that your DSU resource is still valid. You can see on the screen right away when you made, made a mistake or you forgot about something. And because of that, the whole um, the validation gives you the immediate feedback that you made a mistake and you can fix it right away rather than just, uh, you know, code uh, 300 lines just to find out that you missed something and then you have to figure out where you have to update it so that it actually in the end works. Um, so that's enough about talking. Let's move to the demos because yeah, that's obviously the part that you probably will enjoy the most. Before we do, I just wanted to show one more thing because I did mention the differences between class-based uh, resources and MOF-based resources. Uh, I have here um, example of cloud-based resource and the structure for uh, MOF-based resource, how different they are. Uh, so let me just run show tree on show leaf. And as you can see here, this is uh, the classic uh, MOF-based DSE resource. So as I mentioned, you create your uh, root folder with the manifest and within it, you have this DSE resources folder. And within that folder, you get your uh, folders with resources. Usually you call it uh, with the um, organization suffix, uh, uh, so, sorry, prefix uh, underscore your name of the actual resource. And then you have the PSM1 file that defines what you will do, uh, so how you will do that, and the schema of that defines what you want to maintain, basically. Uh, that's definitely different with DSC resources when they are class based. Instead of all the shebang, you just basically get two files the first one containing your manifest with version and uh, this explicit list of the resources that I mentioned initially, and the second file that contains actual code. I know that uh, you can do that differently. I honestly don't see a reason why would you do that, it, un unless it's just because you want to make it similar to the uh, the way it was structured in the past. And, and I, to be honest, I never really felt like this is a right path to go. Uh, so the way we structure it is is this one. We generally just create a folder. Within this folder, we just create two files, one containing information, what the uh, DC resource module will con uh, will have, and the second one is actual implementation of it, and that's it. And it feels definitely more close to the, what uh, the uh, traditional PowerShell modules look like, uh, and we also like that part about it. Okay, enough talking. Uh, let's go to some code examples. So I decided before I jump into the uh, the whole DSC resources, uh, class-based resources, I want to briefly explain classes in PowerShell uh, because even for all you all of you, I, I, at least I expect that are uh, experts in DSC, you might not have too much exposure to the classes thus far. I mean, I hope it will change in the near future, but maybe you haven't really touched them so much. So just, just a few words about that. Um, basically, PowerShell classes are uh, mainly were created for DSC. 
And I would say they're a half-cooked product. They never really got the love that I would expect them to get eventually. I hope that it will change in the future. But thus far, it's they, they kind of work. Some things are not working as, as a developer or uh, people that used classes in other scripting languages would expect. But I would say that it's uh, it's not bad. It's just that it's it's not com future complete. Uh, so two type two type of classes. First one is enums. You get uh, just a type that allows you to specify the list of allowed values. Basically, uh, obviously in DSC or Roam, that makes much a lot of sense, especially with the things like ensure where you want to have just uh, present, absent. Uh, those kind of things definitely work perfectly with uh, the enum class, uh, enum type type of classes. And if you define the class like this, you basically have a static uh, properties named after the. Uh, the, those elements of the list that you can uh, refer uh, refer to, uh, and the second type of class is just like a full full fledged class, where you have three types of elements. First of all, you have your properties, which, as you can see, are defined by specifying the type of the property, and after that variable that will be used as the name of the property. The second element that you can expect within the classes are methods. And here you first specify the type, um, you specify the name, and then you can specify uh, all your parameters. And finally, you specify the script lock that is going to be used uh, to run your code. And last but certainly not least, you have constructors. I won't spend too much time on them because we don't generally use them in uh, DSC. I've seen one example when, when actual actual constructor was used. Uh, but that's not necessary in either. It's uh, very useful in this context, but you can definitely use constructors as well in, in, in DSC resources, in classes in PowerShell, which define what should happen when you do run your, uh, uh, your class with the new or new object or something like that. Uh, so a few examples, we have this class. As you can see, I have two constructors here. I have one property and one method. Uh, let's just define this class. Sorry, we're going to switch to different context, so it switches to uh, console. Let's go back to the editor. And here I have, uh, I, I create the instance using this constructor, as you can see. So then it will assign to bar with assigned any value I specified as a parameter for this constructor. So as you can see, I created instance that indeed has uh, this value for bar. And also, you can use the, the, this constructor and then assign the value. And finally, if you have this uh, constructor that doesn't take any parameters, you can use the syntax that we are familiar with, familiar with since PowerShell 3, where you just cast hash table to, uh, to your uh, class, and then it will just automatically figure out what to do with the properties, uh, with the keys of the, the, the hash table that you passed onto it. Uh, let's go back. And uh, one of the features that is definitely, uh, well, interesting and, and sometimes useful uh, also in the, the context of DSC classes is that you can use actual inheritance. Uh, and obviously you can inherit from the classes you defined, which is sometimes useful and we will get to the examples of that. But also what you can do is you can uh, the inherit from the classes that exist in uh, the pure.net. So you don't have to sometimes reinvent the wheel yourself. So here I'm defining the class that is deriving from web client and what it will do. Uh, let's just run it very quick, all this code. So as you can see, I have the uh, method save to temp, which should save the page that I specified to temp file. And then I'm getting the content of this file. As you can see, this is some uh, gibberish from the uh, from the google.com with some uh, um, closing uh, body HTML uh, uh, tags. Uh, and that's basically it when it comes to just pure classes. Obviously, uh, there's much more to it. I just didn't want to spend too much time on that subject because I want to go back to DSC. Uh, any questions as far? I don't see the chat, unfortunately. Um, we're going to discuss uh, the question that's been on the chat uh, afterwards. OK, perfect. Yeah, I think it will be easier because then I can actually read them and, and answer them right away rather than somebody reading them for me. Um, okay. Um, 
Unfortunately, I didn't if, improve if that. One, if there's one which is really on, on topic, I would say I will, will, I will let you know anyway. Okay. Um, so the way you change the normal class in the class that is DSC resource is by applying this attribute. And I would like to say that's it, but obviously that's not it. Because the moment you do that on any uh, random class, it will tell you what I mentioned before in the in the uh, well, one of the strong features and uh, one of the things I like about class-based resources is that you get this feedback right away. So as you can see, this this uh, class doesn't have anything in it, and DSC resource will not fly without certain things being present in it. So obviously, we need to have set, get, and test that those basically map one to one to set target resource, get target resource, test target resource in your usual uh, DSC resources written in the, uh, with the MOF. Um, and you have to have at least one property that's, that is a key property, which also makes sense because you cannot read this ambiguity, you cannot tell which uh, class you are setting unless you have this key property in it. Um, so we're going to now fix it one by one and we're going to use inheritance to kind of get that eventually. So first one, as you can see, I'm deriving from the resource that was just completely vanilla and was missing a lot of things. And what I did here, I defined the, the methods that uh, that supposed to do what I what 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 uh, uh, PowerShell would expect them to do. So this uh, get method should return the this uh, the same type of element as the class that you were defining, which makes sense. It's just uh, returning what you have. Test needs to return a boolean. Also makes sense. You just want to verify if it's with if it is in desired state or not. And set because it's just changing the system. It doesn't really need to return anything. Therefore, the type that it will return is void. And if you look at the list of the problems that it discovered, it only complains now about the missing the key property. So we derive from the, this uh, uh, semi-broken one. We add uh, the key property. And with that, we have our resource. So we have a key property. And as you can see, we have also other types that are not, necess not, not required. But obviously, if your uh, DSC resource, uh, um, for your resource to be usable, uh, key property is not sufficient because it will allow you to okay to to figure out what you are want what you want to configure, but it will will not allow you to say what how you want to configure it. Uh, and for that, you have multi different types. I, I try to name them after the 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 actual names that you find in the moth based resources. So the key is is the same as the as as we have it in the moth document. Uh, required will uh, be mapped to mandatory. Uh, when it comes to the uh, type of uh, the property, read only is all the non-configurable, so things that you cannot change but you can see. Uh, for example, in the file resource, the, the the fact that you can see what the SHA is, but you cannot really change it. That doesn't make any sense to change that one. And the right properties are just basically don't have any attribute here, uh, which means that they you can write them, but you don't have to. You don't have to specify value for them, and it, uh, the class will still be valid. Or sorry, instance of the class will still be valid. Um, so basically, with all this, you have a skeleton of your DSC resource. But obviously, uh, this is uh, then you need to fill up the blanks. You have to make sure that uh, the set is uh, changing the system, that test is actually uh, properly validating uh, the state of your system, and the, that get it returns the the current state of your of, of the given resource. Um, uh, so the idea of the session was mainly to show you some ideas and some problems that we faced and kind of uh, show you, maybe help you kind of, uh, drive your Im improvements on your, uh, or, or, or your authoring of the DSC uh, class-based resources. Um, so the first, one of the first things we did was uh, inheriting from the useful classes. And I showed it before, this is kind of repeat of that. So as you can see here, I'm defining the DSC resource net file that will derive from system.net web client. And the reason for that, we, we actually, I think we stopped using that one, but the idea was that if we want to use HTTPS to download certain files, we don't want to implement everything by hand. We would rather just use something that already exists. Uh, so if we scroll down here, 
I'm actually using download file, which is basically just a method that you have on the system.net.web client. I didn't implement it myself. I just used the one that is actually already there. And I built it on top of that, added some uh, some things from from my uh, from uh, from me, and made sure that it allows you to specify. Okay, this is the source of my file. This is uh, maybe a hash for this file. If it's different, the hash is different. Download the file and put it on this in this place. Um, so this is for the using uh, inheriting from useful classes. Next thing you can do is let's say you have this resource, but then you decide you need something more on top of that. So we what we had initially, we had this uh, this net file, but we decided okay, we would like to have ability to use it as a, a way to download configuration files, and when we download the configuration file, we do want to do something on the system. So whenever we download, so when we set, we want to perform certain actions to make sure that this configuration file actually takes immediate effect. This is not really uh, completely in line with uh, good practices for generally tools like uh, DSC, which have Puppet, but we, because uh, PowerShell DSC doesn't offer uh, triggers or anything that would work similarly, we decided we will ignore the, 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 the best practices here and we're just, just going to implement it in a way that will work for us as a company. company. Um, so I'm inheriting from the net file and I'm creating the net config file. And because all the things that I defined before are already there, I don't have to worry about configuring the test. I don't have to worry about configuring the uh, the, the get. All those things don't change. The only thing that's changing here is that I want to have the set script property and I want to make it mandatory because I want to ha always have it. And in my set, I can run the set from my parent. And OK, I did download the file. That's what the set would do. And on top of that, I want to create a script block and I want to call it. So basically extensive ex ex extending existing par uh, resources uh, doesn't require you to uh, well take a lot of code outside or uh, duplicating the code, you can just derive or in, sorry, in, you can inherit from the already existing uh, DSC resources that you have in your module and uh, add something to it very in very uh, simple fashion. Uh, next thing I think it's uh, f falls uh, uh, very well with uh, uh, what we saw last time is using get in tests and set. So what we also noticed uh, with generally in, with the public resources and don't forget that we did kind of like five years ago, so it might have changed a lot since. But uh, when we were looking at them back then, uh, we discovered that a lot of gets in not only pub, uh, community based resources, but also the, the, the built in resources were just so broken that they would crash through and do a lot of different things that we didn't like a lot. Um, so that was one of the, the, the drives to, to uh, start using get somewhere. Because, frankly speaking, when you work with DSC, 90% of the time what you do is running test, 9% of the time you're running set, and I left 1% for get, but I think it's 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 it, even that is is kind of uh, exaggerating it a lot. Um, but it doesn't change the fact that if you want to get the state of your system, it would be nice if the get would work. Um, and the second thing why we decided to do that is that it makes what we saw last time, uh, it makes the code for, especially for the test uh, uh, part, so test uh, target resource or in this case test method, way, way more simpler because basically what you do is you, you get current state, you know what your, your what your desired state is and then you all you have to do is just compare if what I got is what I wanted, to, wanted it to be. That's basically it. Uh, and on the, for the setters, well, um, there are scenarios when you really want to know what the current state is. So you are not in your set, you are not changing everything. You just change the things that are not as they are, as, they would, uh, would, well, as you would want them to be. So perfect example of that. Let's say you have IS configuration and you just want to change certain fields in it and you defined 20 of them. And one of them is wrong. You don't want to um, repeat the, the like uh, like reconfigure everything in this IS uh, uh, website or or what have you. Uh, you just want to change this one thing that is not as desired. 
uh, with getter in your set, you can see, okay, this is what I have, this is what I want. So then I just change things that, that are different. And just to show you the example here, I'm getting something. Again, don't focus on the code because obviously that, that code is not something I would put in production. But um, I'm getting something and in my test, I basically checking, okay, the current is this. And then what, what I have to do in tests, plus some uh, some uh, nice code around it to try catch and whatnot, uh, is just compare if the first is the first and the second is the second, basically, right? So it makes the whole logic so much simpler. And I think with uh, what Raymond was presenting last time, it will be even simpler if we would ha just have some helper method somewhere that we can just compare the, those those two things pretty easily. Then we wouldn't even have to write this code. You would just have the very uh, um, nice, uh, sophisticated method uh, that you could reuse. And I will show you in a minute how you could reuse it uh, and uh, multiple resources in your in your DSC uh, class-based resources module. And as I mentioned in the setter, I'm getting what the current is, and I'm checking. Okay, if the current is uh, is uh, fine for first, I'm not going to do anything. If not, I will set first. And if second is is incorrect, I will set second. So I'm picky about what I've changed, and I can do that pretty easily because I'm running the getter from my setter. Um, that also obviously makes sure that you run those gets way more often than you would normally do. And it also means that the quality of the get has to be very good because if your uh, quality of your get is awful, then your test will be awful and you don't want that in any DSC resource. I mean, for setters, maybe not that bad because you don't run them that, that often, hopefully, but uh, the tests have to be really as good as you can get because, yeah, you run them. Uh, depending on your configuration, probably every 15, 17, 30 minutes. And, and you run them always, so you don't want them to be broken or uh, wrong. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just uh, interrupt for a second, because uh, first of all, so you can catch your breath. And people have been saying like they really understand the emphasis on the get, and that's also something that they really use. So they've been chatting about that. Um, and, and yes, and I believe the uh, since the HQRM, uh, started i think the uh, emphasis on the get uh, has really improved i would say in general the the practices and things like this it's much better than it used to be but uh, but yeah definitely I, I agree that the get is probably one of the most even if it was not used by default on the on, by the lcm i would say um then it's still very very important sorry carry on yeah um so um i did kind of uh, um lead to that but let me uh, now uh, explain what i meant by okay if we create some useful uh, useful helper method you can use reuse it between different resources so at certain point we discovered okay we just repeat a lot of code between resources and why are we doing it this is classes we don't have to do that so uh, instead of doing that in every resource we decided okay let's just create some base class in each dc resource module um where we kind of define certain helpful methods that will help us uh, um, avoid repeating the same code over all, over and over and over again and probably making the mistake of forgetting about certain things. Um, but also adding uh, the, some help, useful helper methods that, that basically we can use everywhere for logging and stuff like this. Uh, so one of the things that we discovered, if you ever run a DSC, the DSC run with uh, verbose, you probably saw it a lot that the import module is very chatty. And frankly speaking, we hate it because it just makes the output from uh, verbose uh, semi-useful because uh, most of the, uh, the lines will be just a list of the commands that you imported from the module. So what we def definitely try to do is always have this uh, import module or import name of the module module uh in the base class it also helps you if you for example create a resource for i don't know um i will just just shoot out, uh, shoot out of something we did recently uh, with the convolt uh, api module that we created ourselves uh i just want to make sure that it's imported up front so i can use it in all the, the resources that will uh, that will follow and I wanted to make sure that it's this verbose false is actually there, so I don't uh, basically uh, put too much things in uh, the verbose out that I don't care about. Second thing that we use very often is this report issue, that which allows us to write something to event logs, write write it to the screen, and do it in the way that we want it to be written. 
and then we create uh, because this is uh, classes you can create uh, overrides of the certain methods and then just use different methods in it so for example here i have write error that report is issued which is actual error verbose warning what all those things is uh, i create up front and then uh, in my actual resource i just uh, inherit from that and and i get all the things that were in this base class for free so in my actual code i just do this import module and I'm done. I don't have to think about it. I just use it. And uh, if you, for example, would have something that would allow you to easily compare uh, the current and the test, uh, and sorry, the current and the, the desired state, you could just have it uh, this as the, the method here that would just be in the test and you would just do current equal this get and then uh, get differences uh, sorry, the this dot get differences dollar current, and then all the magic would happen somewhere that you don't have to rewrite yourself every time. So, so that's what we were discussing on the chat uh, slightly earlier. It's uh, the test DSC parameter state, and yeah. that's yeah, yeah, exactly that's, that's yeah, that's exactly where we would put that one in uh, yes. on the base class. Yeah. Yes, yes. So then, if you do that in the base class, you just just get it for free in all the classes that that inherit from that one. And you obviously want to inherit from this base class because that that's the main reason for having this base class in there. Uh, and just a note, um, as uh, Raymond is saying, test DSC parameter state is used in GA DSC, which is a class-based DSC resource. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the ideas that I kind of uh, expand on. We had other ideas as well, so you probably saw it a lot already. But uh, we definitely use a lot of helper methods and properties that helps us to take away the code from the setter testers and. Uh, uh, getters to make them kind of uh, very um, simplified and and easier to understand. Uh, we sometimes we use constants. So for example, if you have something that's shared across the different methods, but you don't necessarily want to put it somewhere else in a, like a global variable, what, ha what have you. Uh, and the example of that would be, for example, uh, would be uh, let's say you, you want to have registry path somewhere that you will re relate to in all your methods, get set test. You just put it in this uh, constant uh, that is not even DSC uh, property, and you can use it in all those with the, this uh, registry path, for example. And something that I discovered recently uh, the, that uh, try catch family works very well in classes, so you can always use finally to clean up. And um, even if you if you throw it from your catch or like write uh, re or return from it. The, the the finally will call be called anyway so we can have this flow of the code very nicely structured and you don't have to worry about leaving something behind um there were some problems i mean there were a lot of them but some of them i want to mention um so first of all we had uh, some older versions of the system so that's actually one of the reasons we uh, that's the reason i didn't mention but it's one of the reasons definitely for uh, the fact that we written our own resources was the fact that a lot of the, the public resources were assuming that you were running 2012 or above. And at the time, and up until uh, I think two weeks ago, we were still having 2008 R2. So all the public resources that were uh, relying on the things in 2012, we just had to ignore that their existence for the time being. And um, what we end up doing for that one Initially, we had some uh, pizza code in our uh, class-based resources, but uh, but what we ended up doing was just wrapping them in the modules and uh, putting those modules on all the boxes that we that we control. Uh, second thing that we definitely struggle with and eventually gave up on was using external DLLs, the LLs in the class-based resources. What I mean by that is basically that you have class-based resource that imports DLL. And I think it was failing on testing that I had discussion about that with Hael when we were kind of uh, dry running this presentation. I didn't have a chance to go back and check what was actually the reason why we had the issue with this, but was definitely some strong problems with having this DLL within the DSC resource itself. Uh, and what we end up doing was just, again, put it uh, in a, a separate module, wrap it up in the PowerShell commands and use those commands in the DSC resource. So okay, now we have uh, we had uh, one I, problem. Now we have two. 
Yeah. Sorry, I think the problem is um, the parser, the, the PowerShell parser looks at the class before the type is in, is uh, imported. Uh, so then we find, he yeah. finds a type which is not there uh, yes. because he hasn't imported yes. it yet. That's the issue. Yeah, that is exactly it. Yes, yeah, that was just it just it was just a nightmare. Um, so uh, okay, I said that we solve the problems by doing modules, but yeah, some of you may say, okay you're kind of making it harder for yourself because now you have modules well we not really because we have dsc resources that we uh, just allow us to deliver the modules and uh, those modules are there for us to use so we don't have to worry about this uh, this issue at all um and finally i wanted to uh, tell you a few words about testing dsc resources um obviously I won't surprise anybody if I say that we are using Pester for that. That's something that you probably expected mm -hmm. uh, from anybody who is saying uh, to do do that with Pester. Um, and the method that we we uh, landed on because we tried ourselves to to come up with a solution for that. Uh, we at first we had some issues with that, and then Ben Halens uh, mentioned that he is actually doing something smart there. Basically, what he's doing is just using module, which allows you to get the classes from the, the your DSC resource, and then you just create an instance of this class, and you just call the methods on it, which is obviously not apples to apples. It's not exactly what the, the, the system will do, but at least it allows you to verify that the code that you have in your getters, testers, and setters is doing what you would expect it to, and it actually uh, response to what you configure your system to be and what you tell uh, your pass to test that system is right now. Um, so what we do there, uh, just to make sure that we always test all our resources, we just have a big switch in our DSC resource, which allows us to iterate through all the exported DSC resources. And by doing that, we just can just say, by default, we will just draw. So if you just try to sneak in the resource in the module that was already previously tested, and you just kind of forgot about the test in quotes, um, you are out of luck. Because right away we will tell you that we don't like it, and we will tell you that this is your resource that is not tested at all. Um, and then for each resource, you basically you have a section that allows us to, as I mentioned, just uh, create the instance of this class. We usually name it the same as the class name so that it's easier to figure out what the hell's going on. Um, and then we just uh, assign certain values to this uh, to this parameters in this class. And then we just run getter. We just verify that the result is as we would expect it to be. Um, so for tester, we just uh, yeah, we just basically just check if the if I say that set the system to be like this in my mocks, and I tell my DSC resource that it should be like that. Will it uh, return in a false or true or what, what the result will be? Um, and for the setters, obviously, there it's more definitely much more mocking because usually you change systems, so you don't want to actually do that in your tests. And uh, first of all, we just run setters and we assert mock called. So this is pretty natural way to do that. But what we also sometimes need, okay, let's say I have some helper methods and I want to be sure that this method is being called in my code because it will, for example, uh, change something in the system. Uh, so what I can do then, because it's just instance of the class, it has this method, obviously. Uh, I can always try to overwrite it with uh, add member and that's uh, very basically, um, uh, Basically, that way we just say, okay, I'm just putting it, uh, I'm replacing this this actual method with my method, and then I do something um, funky like uh, putting something in the test drive, and then I can verify that the test drive actually has this file, as you can see here. Um, and one of the things that my colleague did was actually to write some kind of tooling for that. So we have assert uh, method called, and assert something else uh, and, and, and invoke uh, mocked methods. So basically you have those two pair in pair and, and uh, we just, just uh, invoke uh, methods from this uh, fake uh, method call. And then here we just usually have assert 
uh, assert um, mocked method call, and we can just verify that those those met the helper methods were actually called within the, the our tests. And with that, we basically at least prove that the code is correct. Doesn't mean that we didn't have situations when the actual resource would fail on the machine when we deliver it to it. Obviously, that happens. We don't have proper integration testing, um, I would say, at all. Uh, but at least that prevents us from situation where we expect certain things to happen and they just don't happen because we had a typo or stuff like that. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm Mr. Typo for a reason. So having something that will tell me that I made a typo upfront before I deliver it to the production machine and break it by doing that is always appreciated. So I definitely am glad that we are able to test it at this level at least. Um, I think that's uh, that's it. What I had prepared. Awesome. Uh, so now for the questions, uh, I see one from Daniel. Um, the in module scope. So this is something. So the, the 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 code that you saw right now is not really a representation of what we currently have on our code base, um, because we generally did a lot of in module module scope before. Um, and and we then we we read somewhere that it actually sometimes hides some some things from you, especially when it comes to partial commands. So when you run the commands in the module scope and try to test them there, and we try to do something similar with uh, with uh, the, the I tried to do something similar with my class based resources to make it kind of uh, compliant with this rule that we try to uh, be as close to the actual machine as possible, as close to the actual DSC as possible. And obviously, when you run your DSC resources, you are not in module scope. You're basically outside of it. You just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what actually happens uh, in the the context of the, the LCM, but I suspect it doing something like using this class and then uh, creates instance of this class and, and calls the methods on it, rather than, uh, you know, runs all things within the scope of the module. So to make it as close to the, the reality as possible, I try to do that. It's difficult exercise and definitely a lot of code needs to be rewritten. So if you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and then just ask. Yeah, I think it would be easier minute. because I might miss it in the chat. <laughs> I'm double muted, sorry guys. Uh, that's <laughs> really awesome. I mean, um, from, I think we, there's a lot of resources I think we're keen to move over to to um, class based because you know it's just is more elegant and there's obviously a lot more stuff we can do um i think from what it looks like it looks like the tests would be the the, the trickiest part part to to change especially because you know every every resource module's got its own sort of testing pattern um but i think with the in, in regards to the in module scope i think that's always something that we wanted to be able to get rid of but there were some things we just couldn't easily test without it um, so most of them are landed that way the integration tests are where we'll probably get the closest to the lcm um, well it is going to use the lcm behavior so i think as long as we can keep those integration tests running we'll you know we'll catch the remainder of the 90 remainder of it um, from your experience you know um because uh, um what's have you done a conversion from a moth based to a class based um and what was that like or have you only ever done sort of class started with the class based sorry i muted myself <laughs> just just a habit of working from home right now is just just muting myself at the moment i stop speaking um and talking on mute later um so yes initially we had uh, the moth based resources um and uh Frankly speaking, I didn't enjoy authoring them at all. I know that there were already back then, there were really nice helper modules uh, um, and uh, they would allow me to, to verify that my MOF is correct or, or make sure that uh, my uh, PSM1 file is actually structured the way it should be and, and it has proper parameters. Uh, but the problem was that even even uh, like update uh, DSC resource would just just restructure code the way that I didn't like, put the curls you know on the wrong lines and stuff like this. And I was like, uh, okay, and would change in coding I think. So I was not really happy with that part. But also, you know, this whole disconnect was just kind of getting on my nerves a lot of times because, yeah, you you kind of want to to have the code to just you just want to write the code and make it work. 
and here you had to remember always to go back to MOV or, or change the MOV first and then update your uh, PSMO one, one file and make sure that it kind of works. And um, and also, you know, even even if I don't uh, run pesto tests, for me, the testing of the DST resource is pretty easy. I'm just using module. I create the instance of this class and, and I'm free to go and I, I just just run with it. Uh, I wouldn't feel so 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 eager to just do import module on the uh, regular DST resources because I would probably forget after five minutes which resource I currently have because I would have to remember is it ta get target resource from this module or this other module. Uh, and uh, that DSC is m definitely much more explicit about it because you just have instance of the given class and you run get test set on it and that's it, right? So that, that, that definitely makes the whole experience uh, much more um, yeah, streamlined and, and, and mm. kind of natural. Uh, so for me, I think that the, the whole, the, maybe the, the separation of the meta and the, the code itself was, was probably the main drive to, to just, just run away from, from mob based resources. So the only time yeah. when I come back to them is when, when I do something for the public ones. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we would definitely consider moving them all over. I don't think there's any need to support, um, WS man four, right? We originally supported we had to stick with MOF, I think, because of PowerShell 4 support, but I I don't think that's a requirement anymore. Gun Gale. is in fire. That's what you want to say, but I, well, is it? I mean, I guess we, we can, we did we make that call in the end that we were going to say, look, we were going to drop PowerShell 4 support or not guarantee it. It's going to be down to the individual module maintainers. So yeah, so so, th so that's the thing. So it depends on the maintainers, right? So MOF is still something which is supported. Uh, so the my point of view in there is, um, so whether you use DSC MOF-based resource or class-based resource, to me what's important is um, DSC is just the interface of some of the PowerShell commands. So when someone wants con to consume some automation, either they are using PowerShell interactively or within scripts, or they use um, they use the DSC resource to be more declarative, uh, whether they use uh, DSC Chef Puppet, Ansible, or something else. But but it's just different interface if you want to the same imperative scripting behind it. So um, so that's uh, I just want to reiterate the point that Bartek said earlier. Uh, you use helper module a lot. So then in the end, your DSC interface is just to make sure you have this uh, ID dependency going on with your, your declarative resource. And that is the key. So if you need to refactor, yes, because you need to remove, if you have, if you have a DSC resource, which is uh, 2000 lines of code, something is wrong. It should probably be uh, much smaller. I would say a few hundred lines of code just to do this declarative structure where you have the get, the test and the set, but calling uh, different, it could be other classes, to be honest, but calling all the things which is in a, in a different module, in, in a helper module, what we call a helper module. So that's, I think that's the key important. And yes, we probably need to refactor because not all resources are like this. Yeah, some of the, un, 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 the less maintained ones are probably more like those 2000 lines of code ones. Um, but most of the other, yeah, most of the HQRM ones I've, I think have been sort of refactored so that moving to class based should be reasonably easy. Um, I'm thinking of something like schedule, schedule task, uh, where there's a lot of code, but it's all split out into into helper functions. Yeah, and I think it's uh, something that we need to learn and improve on this, but, but it's good to have this presentation so then we can kick it off. Mm. And then it's good that Raymond already started on GADSC. Well, actually, uh, Chris already started class-based. Chris, uh, uh, Chris Gardner, I believe, started uh, the GADSC using class-based anyway. So it's good that we we improve, and then we probably need to improve the DSC resource.test module, so then it catches a bit more yeah. uh, things, and then we need to obviously collaborate around it. So then uh, it just it looks like it we'll also need to do the um, uh, the auto documentation. I think I, I that may have been done. I can't remember, but. Yes, yeah, we remember we used to do um, a lot of the modules like SharePoint and um, I don't know. Does SQL Server does Johan does SQL Server do auto documentation yet, or is that still not yet not over to that? Uh, not yet entirely. Uh, it's on its way, Cl slowly. It shouldn't there. be too hard. <laughs> it's just a yeah. The MOF was used to to build that um, parameter list and and do other bits and pieces. So, but I'm sure that could be 
done. Has anyone considered creating a converter, some code that'll actually do a conversion? Automate the conversion process from a MOF base to a class base? It shouldn't be too difficult. Well, it's not difficult if, so yes, it's possible. It's not difficult if you're, especially if you're, um, if your DSC resource doesn't have many other um, uh, functions, so then you don't have to create many methods. Because the problem is, if you create methods, then you're missing probably some metadata, like what types you're returning, um, how do you returning it, is it strongly typed, and things like this. But if you just have your get target resource, set target resource, uh, and test target resource, it's easier to convert because you just get the metadata from the MOF. Uh, by loading in SIEM or something, and then you can create that. I think we it's in our interest not to do it automatically, but to make sure yeah, we just um, explode it manually, I would say, in function, so then we make sure we don't have, um, you know, bad, uh, at least we understand the problems, the challenges we may have. But obviously yeah, I mean, we can't you would, do all at once. I don't think you would do it, you would necessarily automate and then leave it you would have to do a you know it would be the automation would just help you get to the first step more easily rather yeah, than very much cutting and pasting and that's actually yes something we could do uh, uh, creating at least from the MOF file creating the base class mm. that yeah. would be something we could do yeah we could think yeah. about this um I'm just going to go, because I'm conscious of the time, I'm just going to go quickly through the progress on the GitHub board. Um, so, we, uh, so we've got seven more uh, since the last call, seven more um, updated uh, DSC resource module to the new CI process. We still have 23 to go. And these are the one that's been converted in the last call. So we've got security policy DSC, ISCSI DSC, XDSC diagnostics, DFS DSC, external DSC, file content DSC, storage DSC, office online server DSC. And well, GA DSC, we talked about it a few times today. This is in progress. Um, I think Raymond is close to be done. He's got already a review from Johan. So he's uh, finishing that one off. And uh, FSRM DSC, Daniel, you're working on that one, I believe. And next on the list, um, I think we've done the most used ones. Uh, we still need to work on DSC resource analysis, XBit Locker, XDSC resource designer. So that's the one if we were to implement, as you said, a gen like something to generate the base class, then it's probably where we should put it. And uh, audit policy DSC is probably another one that we should tackle at some point. And obviously, um, last time we already raised this, so we thinking of deprecating XRubocopy, XWordPress, XPHP, X Azure Pack, and X MySQL. I just added MySQL actually, just I don't know. I wanted to see if people would react, but um, I don't think there's one I really use these days. But uh, we haven't done anything about it. We're just saying probably these are not the one we're going to convert to the new CI process. The old DSC resources are still published. But if no one's using it and no one's contributing to them and no one asks for it, then probably we're going to archive those. No one's screaming, so that's fine. And these are the releases uh, since the last call. Uh, they probably like SQL Server DSC add I don't know how many uh, preview releases, so I don't know when you're gonna plan uh, plan on doing like 4.0, uh, 14.0.0, uh, Johan. Uh, I, th I thought I want to get in all the breaking changes that is uh, currently. Okay, we're gonna discuss that next. Uh, and update services DSC. I should probably release that as soon as I got time. So by Sunday, if I haven't done it, just let me know. I just need to push a tag and do it. And yep. Yeah and a few others that have been progressing. Um, if you, if there's a preview you want to get released, make sure you tell that on if you've tested it, the preview, make sure you tell the maintainer that uh, you've tested it, it works, and uh, you'd like it to be released as soon as possible. So the next call is 1st of July, 12 p.m. Uh, PDC, so same times, but 1st of July, and Johan, you wanted to discuss the SQL Server uh, question, SQL Server DSC 1. Exactly, should I take it down? I can present here. Go ahead. There we go, I think. Can't see your screen.
I can't see a screen on that Billy. I don't know if I'm alone, but. Ooh. I think he got dropped from the call or something. Okay, we've lost him. All right. So I'm. I'm. Let me just grab the call. Oh, I'm back on here. Are you yeah. back? All right. Yeah, teams crashed. <laughs> Surprising. Let's try again. I'm sharing my screen now. Let's see if it uh, works. Yes. Yes. Cool. Uh, so, uh, as you said, uh, there's a lot of preview releases, and I'm I'm trying to get in all these uh, breaking changes. It was uh, twice the amount here before, so uh, I'm I'm hoping at least getting uh, those last one, uh, those three at the bottom here before I release 14. Uh, any help appreciated. But uh, what I wanted to discuss was this one, uh, the renaming resources. So uh, when we converted uh, SQL Server DC to, from X SQL Server to SQL Server DC, we did some renaming of uh, resources at that time. Uh, we left some uh, at that point. Uh, according to the naming convention, we uh, put up uh, at that time is here, I can show. So we, we in this, uh, this is a naming convention for the DC resources in SQL Server DC. And we have server here in the scope. And that's why some are still named server. But since I'm working on uh, a lot of breaking changes for SQL Server DC now. I thought, okay, maybe it's time to rename these because uh, it can indicate that when a resource is named server, it can indicate that the resource is, is managing multiple instances on the server. So a SQL Server is not, you can install several instances on the, C, on the server uh, each instance has several databases and so on. Uh, so uh, those resources that are here in the first column here are named SQL Server Configuration, SQL Server Database, SQL Server Endpoint, and so on. So my suggestion was, okay, maybe we can rename these uh, because they are not actually managing or enforcing properties on the actual server. They are actually enforcing properties on the instance or an object in the instance, on the SQL Server instance. So my proposal was maybe we should rename them to this, to the initial comment, uh, to the second column. And the third column is uh, from the discussion we had below, but I wanted to show here. Uh, so we have we have resources that actually manage and enforces properties on the server. We have SQL setup and SQL RS setup that are in installing instances on the server. So so if any of the resources would be named server, these would be the ones. So these uh, managing Windows firewall. Uh, serve, uh, managing a SQL services on the server and managing a SQL server ADSS on in this SQL native client configuration. Uh, but so all these that are green, I think, uh, even if I, I don't want to rename these, I thought I think these are working as they are. And so all green is uh, pretty much, let's leave them as is. But the red ones is those we are discussing now. So if you can see here, these are the, all the, the resources are managing a database instance. So these resources are managing a database object these resources are managing an availability group object or things in an availability group. And this resource managing roles that are present on the SQL Server instance. 
a database can also have roles, but these are all the roles on the actual server. So, so you can have like the sysadmin, uh, those roles that are in the top level hierarchy. Uh, Let me ask you quickly to the people on this call. If you're using SQL Server, DSC, uh, the, the module, or any of the resource, can you just please put, like, put something in the chat so then we know if you're using it or not? Yeah. Sorry, so, on. yeah. So then we have for a database. So we have roles objects, we have database objects, we have logins objects, we have endpoints objects. So we have databases objects that are don't have SQL Server in that doesn't have the server in this in this name. This one is an object but has server in this name. And same as these have server in the name. So these are pretty much to, to to be to look like these. We should rename these at least. Uh, then we come to those. These are managing configuration that uh, co like uh, like this one uh, managing uh, the protocols, uh, network protocols on the instance. So these affect uh, several databases, uh, several logins. It, it affects uh, the entire instance. So if you disable uh, TCP IP protocol, then uh, the instance uh, stops working unless you can connect to some other way. Uh, and so memory, max dope, uh, database email, configuration. Uh, these, these resources, the, the properties they enforce affects several other objects in the instance. So the reason for these that they are called server is because the SQL server team are actually calling uh, things in the database engine for SQL server. Um, and that's probably because it's an old legacy since there were no other services. Uh, it's, that's my guess at least. Uh, but now I'm thinking to make these resources look alike and make them indicate that they are not enforcing properties on the actual server. Uh, maybe we should just rename them and remove server from its name. So that is what I want to discuss today. Um, so and uh, people here might not on the call might not know about this but uh, please um, comment on the issue if you are interested in this um, yeah, yeah so we're slightly over the time but if you have a question right now for johan feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question and in general go on upvote whatever decisions you want on the github issue yeah and if you have no questions or no objections. And I have this at the bottom. I have the diagrams here, the mind maps here too as well. So, yeah. So everyone's happy for the rename, that's good. Yeah, I don't see any problem with that. I mean, uh, if, if there's a lot of breaking changes anyway, then uh, we'll have to go through our configs uh, to update it. So. Uh, and a few name changes uh, are fine as well. I think that's the main point of Johan is he wants to like if, uh, if people are happy with the change, he wants to be able to create one big breaking change before you release the full like uh, an actual version, like yeah. a major release version. Yeah. yeah. I uh, the only the only thing I have which is not definitely it's not specifically related to your proposal. Uh, it's just that if you just call SQL something, then it's a bit too generic. If it was MS SQL, then people would know it's Microsoft SQL Server as just a general kind of thing. But uh, but it's fine because we know the history of that. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I don't want to touch the other resources. I don't have to. So I assumed as much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Anyone has a question or something to say? 
You uh, should probably thank Bartek for the presentation. I was about we, to. We, we all should. I was, about to, I was trying to look uh, down, like if he was, if he has left, because I forgot to say thank you a lot. Thank you a lot, Bartek. Thank you for uh, doing it. And, and to be fair, Bartek's done it twice because he did a dry run with me last week. So, um, so no, that was that was really good. And I think uh, it's. Uh, I really wanted to get that one in because um, I, I think uh, we should start. Um, we should start thinking about migrating to uh, class-based DSC resource for the DSC community at least. Yeah, <laughs> I love the I love the stickers you got, Bartek. Thank you, Bartek, and uh, and feel free to come back for another presentation. Sure, loved it. <laughs> well, the cut like that, I have no choice, right? It's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was an awesome presentation, Bartek. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining. Next one is in July the 1st. Thank you. Uh, uh, someone from Microsoft, can you stop the recording? Maybe Raman, you've got to do it. No, I think Brian started the recording. Brian, still in the call?